Mark, I, how I wish we had time to discuss, because there's a lot of that I, I disagree with, but we are here to hear your opinion <laughs> on all of these other things. Hi, Mark. It's great to finally meet you. Um, why aren't you with us in Dundee? Okay, I'm going to blame my wife for this one. And it, and it's true, right? So uh, it was, a, let's say, a significant milestone birthday. And she has never been to Asia. She's always wanted to go. And I got a chance to go to Hong Kong to do a, a talk. And it was exactly at the same time as this. So I said to her, look, you know, it's your year. It's your birthday. Dundee or Hong Kong, what do you want to do? <laughs> and I can't understand why, but she decided to go to Hong Kong instead. So we're leaving on Friday. So that's why I'm not there. You were a child growing up in Dundee, and I wondered what it was like for you as a child in 1970s Dundee. I was growing up in 1970s Aberdeen, so I'm, I'm interested in that. Wow, and we have lots of questions, and you give me a minute to go through this. I could take up like half an hour just with this. What was it like? I mean, what do you say in brief about this? Uh, it wasn't all doom and gloom by any means. I mean, there was a very strong sense of community. I remember growing up, you know, even though I was likely to get punched out by the kids from the Rocky uh, because I was a Catholic and I was making my way home from school, you didn't live in fear. Um, everybody went out in the streets and played at night, kicked a ball, whatever it happened to be. You grew up with music. You grew up with a fantastic music scene. As you can see, that my inheritance is still behind me in that regard. Um, so in many ways, you know, even though it was a, a poor upbringing, we were all poor. None of us were rich at that time. The difference, I said this to someone last night, the difference is between somebody who was in a kind of bot house, the middle class house, and the sort of prosperous working class back then was about 10 to 20 percent. Now the difference is like 150 percent. Right. And that was the difference. Like things were just a lot more sort of equal. And that created a sort of society in which mobility across barriers was much easier. Yeah, I, I certainly recognise that as well. Now, um, what led you to studying political science in Glasgow? Um, so it was, it's sort of economics, political science, sociology, the whole thing. What happened was I left school when I was 16. Actually, I was thinking I was even 15 because I was young going to school uh, because of music. I just wanted to play in bands. I was playing in clubby bands. It was all good. Nobody in my family had ever gone to school. And uh, then I fell in with a woman and she said to me, I'm going to university. You're not a turnip. You should think about this as well. And I discovered that they, back in the day, they gave you a grant. They didn't charge you fees and they gave you a grant. And it's like, you're going to pay me to read stuff I'm interested in? This is awesome. So I went to night school, as it was, even though it was during the day, at an annex of the commercial college up on the Clintonton Road. And I did A-levels. And I got my A-levels and I got into school and I moved to Glasgow and I went to Strathclyde. Yeah, I know that college. That was where I did my access course. <laughs> so, right. So I, was, I just did a version of that. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. How did you feel when you're unable to study in the USA? Um, it was something I wanted to do because I have, I have two brothers. Sadly, one of them died back in 1992, shortly after I moved to the US. Uh, but uh, we all split. I mean, the thing about it was the sort of like halcyon days of the 70s growing up gave to gave way to the sort of deindustrialization, unemployment and poverty nightmare that was large parts of Scotland in the 1980s. And basically, my second brother was living in California at that point, And I went out and I saw something that no Scotsman of, of my generation had ever seen before, which was consistent sunshine in January. And within about three weeks of staying there, I stopped smoking and I bought a pair of running shoes. And you know that thing that we hate about Americans, that relentless positivity? I'm convinced it's just sunlight. And I, I fell for it. And then I just wanted to go back after that. I applied to a bunch of graduate schools and I got into to Columbia. So why did you decide to become a U.S. citizen? Because it's where I've been. I mean, you know, I've spent longer. I've been here for 33 years. And, and, and in many ways, my attitudes are very American. I just, you know, call it like you see it um, and recognize that sort of like, you know, not everything is uh, amenable to solutions uh, that are easy. Um, what else could I say about Americans? A bias for optimism, right? And um, sort of, I just, I like it. I like the dynamism of the society. I think it's very attractive. Would you describe yourself as a political economist and, yes. and not just an economist? What's yes. the difference? Could you explain that? Sure, my PhD is in political science. A large part of that is a study of something called international political economy. It basically takes, you know, the same level as kind of like the, kind of the first year of like graduate PhD if you were just doing pure econ. 
but then are layers on top of that study of institutions, ideologies, history, culture, et cetera, et cetera, and produces a much more, in my opinion, sort of holistic and deep and rich understanding of how economies work. What are the areas that you're particularly interested in at the moment in economics? Basically, climate change. Uh, I'm 56 years old. I've probably got about 10 years or more productive left in the game. I might as well actually try and do something that matters for future generations. Um, so decarbonization, I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in, there's a sort of a debate about de-risking without going into it too much. Essentially, sort of, you keep waiting for the private sector to do all this stuff, and ultimately you have to bribe them so much and they still don't do it. So then people turn around and say, well, the states should do it. And I go, have you seen what our states look like? They can't even build a railway. So how is that one going to work? So basically, it's in that space about what's possible, what can we actually do, how do we do that? So decarbonization, how economies grow, why we still need growth, why the idea of degrowth, I think, is kind of it's kind of problematic, particularly from an electoral point of view. But I just wondered if we could speak a wee bit more about this idea of growth models. We're going to look at the UK's growth model and Scotland's growth model when we become independent. Um, can you explain why you're really interested in this idea of growth and growth models? So one of the things you'll notice sitting in, in not just the United Kingdom, but in France and other places, is that if you go back say, 30, 40 years, growth was much more widely shared. In a sense, you had a national economy. And when you work at the scale of a national economy, Aberdeen's an important place. Aberdeen's still important because of its fossil fuel anchor, but if you take that away, why would Aberdeen be important? Once you globalize the economy, once you no longer kind of like make a lot of things yourself, once you specialize in this kind of global division of labor, then the nodes necessarily get bigger because the network gets bigger, right? So London, London's 30% of GDP, right? If I go to Paris, it's 30% of GDP. If I go to Amsterdam, it's 33% of GDP. If I go to Dublin, it's 50% of GDP. So what's the growth model for Limerick? What's the business model, if you will, of Limerick? If 50% of everything is in Dublin, right? Why is it everybody moves to London? Because that's where the jobs are. Because that's where everybody moves, because that's where the jobs are. That's where you get the demand. That's where you get the investment. So it's these sorts of things, understanding these kind of spatial dynamics of growth and how it affects inequality and distribution. That's actually, it just seems to me to be like something worth looking at. Which dead economist would you most like to have co-written a paper with? And which living economist? I think the dead one would have to be Keynes, uh, if only because uh, a man that sort of like weird and interesting, who is a mathematician as well as being somebody who's a literary figure and, you know, in the Bloomsbury circle, the whole thing and, you know, writes this book that, you know, doesn't directly transform the world, but kind of captures a lot of what everyone was thinking about in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, which that then changed the world. So he'd be the dead one. Uh, in terms of the living one, who would I really like to like? probably like have dinner with rather than anything else who would it be that's a really tough one there's a long list of contenders uh and i've had dinner with a lot of them so i'm going to pass that one back i'm not really sure who i would say to that <laughs> all right well which dead economist would you like to have dinner with then or have a beer with well that again it would probably be Keynes, but if i had to pick another one it'd be Schumpeter. Okay. So Fantastic. just for people who don't know he was the guy who theorized business cycles first he was long wrong about loads of stuff uh, but he was super interesting and also write about a whole bunch of stuff. His whole idea of sort of the importance of investment and entrepreneurship, et cetera, is really actually quite important um, and doesn't fit well within sort of standard framework. So super interesting guy. I read your book, Angronomics, Mark, and I have a few questions on it. So I have a few things to say to you about this big man. So let's bring it on. <laughs> so in Angronomics, you describe capitalism using the analogy of uh, software, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh -huh. Can you describe those versions to our audience? And why did you hit on this particular anal analogy? In, in a minute, describe this whole thing. It takes off 40 pages in the book. Ah, good one. Um, I'll try. How did I come up with this? This will actually explain it better, right? Um, I got interested in tech a wee while ago because back in 2010, at the height of the financial crisis, the financial press started to produce all these articles. You'll remember this. Uh, based upon a book, an initial book called Race Against the Machine. And it was all about um, uh, big data sets, which have been around forever, and machine learning, right? And it was before anyone would have said AI, as just the latest version of this, right? And all these reports came out, 60% of all jobs are going to be automated by 2015 and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, this is it was the World Economic Forum stuff. And I thought, this is absolute pish. So I started to get interested in this. And the way that I get interested, in, when I get interested in things and I want to figure out how things work, I can go read the academic literature on it. But it's kind of like going to, a, you need a plumber and you go talk to your mate who's a sparky and ask him. 
right? It's not, it's not really what you should do. So I tend to go, I went, I go to tech conferences. The easiest way to get into tech conferences is to do gains in trade. That's what economists do. So they want to know things like, how does the economy work anyway? So I would go to their conferences and speak, and then I would talk to them about tech. So I had to come up with a way of explaining how kind of capitalism changes over time. And I came up with this analogy of the institutions of heart of capitalism being like hardware. And then the ideas of eco economists and economic ideas in general being the software. And what happens over time, you get a kind of match between them at a certain point. It's like the system crashes, you rebuild the hardware, you get new software, it all goes great. After a while, bugs build up in the system, the bugs destabilize, it crashes, and you fix it or you don't. And that's basically an analogy for thinking about large-scale economic change. Do you think the emergence of, as you, as you put it, the emergence of a lifeless and largely self-serving technocratic center which caused large segments of the electorate to feel voiceless and unrepresented, and who continue to see labour as a commodity might be a driver for people's anger. Oh, I think that wins the No Shit Sherlock Award. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and it's still the case today. I mean, I'll give an example of this. Right, The one thing that unites the angry left and the angry right is they both think the system's fixed. But they think it's fixed for different reasons. And here's one of my examples of this. So I tweeted this out today. There was a graph in The Guardian. It was five-year average of tax payments by very large companies in America and five-year average of payments to their CEOs. And the one that caught my eye was AT&T. Now, I'm sitting here with an AT&T product, right? It works. This company is not bankrupt by any means, right? Uh, well, it's an Apple phone, but it's on the AT&T network, right? Sorry, it's not AT&T. It's T-Mobile. I must correct myself, right? So anyway, point is, um, they don't pay taxes. They get so many write-offs and all the rest of it that I will pay personally more taxes than at and uh, than. T-Mobile. Uh, for years, I checked this every year against the accounts of, of General Electric when they used to be a big firm. For a decade, I paid personally more taxes than General Electric, right? There is no universe at all in which this is fair, just, or understandable, other than the fact that they make the money, they get to keep it, and then they tell us there's nothing for anything else. I get the sense that this anger is actually starting to translate into action in the UK. Do you think that that's also happening in the US? It is, but you know where it's happening is essentially on the right, and what you've got is MAGA, right? That's what that's what MAGA is. Now, you know, people love to do this thing where they go, "All right, so your average Trumper is actually richer than the average person, so it's not really about people who've been screwed over." Here's a simple way to think about that: your average Trumper is about my age. They're overwhelmingly men. And the reference group isn't the entire economic distribution because that includes African Americans, minorities, women, etc. It's other white dudes. And if you do basically the white dude income distribution for Trumpers, the median's 110,000. Your average Trumpers on 70,000, the median for the country 60,000, or at least that was the time of the last general election. So these are the people that have been affected by dislocation, globalization, the China shock, all the rest of it. They've been told to learn new skills in midlife without any way of ever raising the funds to do so. They're the ones that are facing lunatic level college tuition for their kids, etc. And they're the ones who think correctly but that the game is fixed. So unfortunately, the, the, the left of the political spectrum uh, in the United States have no way to articulate this because they're the handmaiden of the policies that actually made this thing happen. So what you get is a reaction on the right to it. Years ago, I, I, got, I got Trump's victory. You can check this on YouTube. There's a video of me, July 16, it would have been, saying he's going to win. And I do this whole analysis of why he's going to win. And everyone in the audience is laughing at the whole thing. And then four days after the election, I went on Fox News when Tucker Carlson was still there. And he said, tell me what you told our room. And he let me talk for over five minutes without interruption, just basically saying what I said there just now. And he says, why can nobody else see this? And he says, because it's very hard to see something is wrong when your income depends on it. What are the big things that you think are really, for you, different between the, the way the economy is run in the US and the way it is run in the UK? I wouldn't say it's a question of how it's run, right? I mean, because, you know, the notion that the government actually runs the economy is one of those sort of myths that we keep alive for electoral purposes, because otherwise, why bother with them? But they don't actually run the economy. I mean, you got to think about it this way, right? Let's think about the UK. One of the things that we know about the UK is things have been bad since 2008. We've all seen the graph of like where income should be and where they've been since 2008, right? Why is that? Because of the dominance of the financial sector, which never really recovered from the crisis. If you look at the FTSE, the British stock market, and you take out the international components, which are primarily carbon majors and miners and things like this, and they don't really have any operations in Britain, uh, your average British company barely makes a profit. 
Uh, so it's highly concentrated in finance. It's dependent on consumer debt, consumption, swapping houses, all that sort of stuff, right? It was a great laugh for a while, but eventually the wheels came off the wagon and now they have to rebuild it. They have to, in fact, change the growth model, right? Now, let's think about the way that Scotland talks about itself. Scotland, particularly nationalist circles, loves to say that Scotland is a small open economy like the Nordic economies. That's a bit like saying I'm a supermodel because I also have legs. It's simply not true when you really think about it. And here's why. You're a periphery part of a small free trade zone called the United Kingdom. You have thousands of micro enterprises that trade with each other and trade with the United Kingdom. You have hardly any international trade in comparison to actually genuine small economies. You have no global champions at scale in the way that they do in Scandinavia and other places. It's a very different place. Now let's think about the United States. The United States contains about at least three or four different major business models. You want to understand American politics? Start in Alaska, go to uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, run through Texas, go through the Panhandle states, Alabama, Mississippi, come out to West Virginia. All of those are red states, deep red states. What do they all do? Farms, fuel, fertilizer, carbon. That's what they do. Now, what's on the coast? Everything else, software, finance, real estate, government services, movies, all of that, right? What is it the blue states want to decarbonize? What is it the red states want to sell you carbon? You can see the problem. Mm. Yeah, right? But that's only part of it. The United States is the world's largest agricultural exporter. It's the world's largest next to China green state investor because of the IRA. At the same time, it's also the world's largest carbon exporter. Yeah. Go figure. It's yeah. a very big, different place. And, and what do you think about Bidenomics? Uh, it's a catchphrase that people have talked about, and I've even done a podcast on it trying to work it out. I mean, essentially what it is is the United States government recognizes that there is no long-term future in being a carbon producer, that long-term they, like everybody else, need to get off this because it's a dangerous drug. And the attempt of Bidenomics is essentially to create the IRA, which would have been built back better, which would have been even bigger, as a series of subsidies so that the private sector of the United States and the public sector can basically build green tech. That's it. That's all Bidenomics is. Why is it the Republicans hate it? Because if they succeed, their assets, their carbon assets, lose value, which is why the Koch brothers, who you probably heard of, lobby so hard against green stuff. Well, of course they would. They're basically a giant engineering oil conglomerate. What would you expect them to do? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take you away from the States now. So Argentina, can you explain what will happen <laughs> in that economy over the next 12 months? What do you think? These are brilliantly random questions. Um, Argentina's problem forever has been its exchange rate and the fact that it's a commodity producer. Um, the whole of Latin America, 70% of all jobs are still basically related to exporting commodities to the north to be finished. The problem with that is, is when there's a big demand for, a co for commodities, people overinvest in them, the supply increases, the price is still really high, but then eventually the price drops, you've got too much supply, it crashes. That affects your exchange rate because all you really do is commodities, you don't actually make a lot of your own stuff. That means you have to import everything. Suddenly your import prices get really, really high. That pushes up inflation. And then the only way you can accommodate that is by printing money at the central bank. Rinse and repeat for the past 30 years. What is Malay going to do? He's going to come in bound with a monetary theory of inflation for what is really an exchange rate driven inflation that's augmented by money and try and slash and burn everything through austerity and that won't work. What might work is the fact that Argentina is betting on two things, that they're going to have in the next two or three years absolutely massive soya crops, the exports will pick up, and that they too will become, guess what, a carbon producer from the gas fields that they've got. So when they start selling all that, their balance of payments goes the right way rather than the wrong way, the exchange rate strengthens, imports cost less, the inflation goes down, and Malay, if he's still around, will declare victory for shit that's got nothing to do with him or his politics. Like the vast majority of politicians tend to do. Um, there's a narrative at the moment that uh, the American economy is doing better than the, let's say, the European economy because of a government or deficit-led industrial strategy that doesn't really seem to exist in Europe. What's your thoughts on that broad kind of narrative? I think part of that's true in the sense that, yes, it helps to have like the IRA and, and COVID spending that was much bigger and all the rest of it, right? But at the same time, I mean, I just did a book, book plug. Um, it's coming out next year called Inflation, a guide, a guide for Users and Losers. And one of the things I looked into was called the Survey of Consumer Finances, right? Where, when people got the stimulus checks, what did they do? Because the narrative was it was a bunch of bros who bought Bitcoin. I was like, mm, OK, let's check this out. And it turns out that three months after the stimulus checks went out, the next quarter, 
you saw the largest reduction in credit card debt in recorded mm -hmm. history. The next stimulus check was followed by a massive payment of back rent. Neither of those things are stimulatory. They're compensatory, right? So the growth of it's coming might be coming from somewhere else. A lot of it has to do with tech. A lot of it has to do with the dominant, of, if you will, stock market capitalism here, the AI hype, the Magnificent Seven, all that sort of stuff. A lot of it has to do with the fact uh, that uh, we now have tighter labor markets because immigration has slowed down. Uh, baby boomers are retiring. That's pushing up wages. Uh, American companies are faster to automate because of those pressures. The automation leads to higher productivity. Higher productivity then translates into higher growth. And generally speaking, American companies just grow faster. It's just differential growth, which is why people invest in dollar assets. I could put money in the, in the FTSE, and I know how fast it's going to grow. I can put money in the S&P 500. It'll grow three times as fast. Why would, I, why, why would I even think about it? So to a certain point, it becomes self-reinforcing in that way. You explain what the UK's post-war, post-empire growth model. It's really interesting in this one as well. It depends on what you're, what you're focusing on as being the growth model, right? So was India a huge part of British growth in the 19th century? Yeah, absolutely. Um, is that why they fell off a cliff afterwards? No, it's really because they blew a shit ton of money in World War One and never really recovered. Um, what was the post-war growth model? Same as everybody else's. Everybody made cars, everybody made steel, everybody made ships, all the rest of it. And then as the world economy grew, this kind of, you might have heard the term a fallacy of composition. The whole is not the same as the sum of the parts, right? Well, any one economy could practice what we sometimes call Fordist economics, right? Mass production, factories, people making stuff, industry is a huge component of GDP. All of that depends upon having stable inputs in, terms, in the forms of prices of raw materials and labor mm. conditions, the labor prices, all the rest of it. Now, you know, anybody can make car. Sweden made cars. There's not many Swedish people. So clearly they had to sell them to people outside of Sweden. And the Brits made cars, but there was lots of Brits. So that's why we had the Austin Allegro, which was a disaster that everyone should apologize for, right? And the British car industry, because it was protected by tariffs, wasn't very good. And that's why it eventually went bust and all the rest of it, right? But once the whole world starts making cars, either you're really, really good at this or you go out of business fast. So the British business model just went out of business. It just wasn't very good once everybody started to do this at the same time. The response of that could have taken multiple forms, but the form that it did take was essentially the one that Thatcher did. Now, you know, we think about Thatcher and the banks and privatization and all this sort of stuff, but that was always the second best strategy for that mob. What's really fascinating is you go back and look at what they actually wanted to do. They wanted to free finance, not because of the sake of free finance, but to reinvest in British industry. So what they did is they, you, you privatize the banks and all the rest of you, deregulate the banks. And what do they do? They asset strip British industry because being in finance is much more profitable. And then you give everybody a credit card and a mortgage. And that's brilliant because basically the thing that banks never tell you is what they call an asset, we call a liability and vice versa. Right. So when banks talk about we have 300 billion in assets, what they mean is we've made 300 billion promises to get a pound back oh, yeah. and I hope that we get it. Right. So you're building tremendous fragility into this growth model based upon bank credit, private sector credit. And that's what came tumbling down in 2008. And that's what you've never really recovered from. That, that explanation, I think, for, for me, misses out the uh, regional aspect. And because my understanding is that growth, growth model was very much focused on financial services, not exclusively in London, but predominantly in London in the southeast. And this idea that that's how the British economy would grow and the rest of the economy would somehow benefit from this thing called yeah, I think trickle that's down. No, I think that's exactly yeah. it, right? I mean, if you think you think about food security, something we think about these days, right? Well, the, 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 the Blair government did a report into food security under conditions of globalization because, you know, we stopped making loads of it and we basically import it and all the rest of it. And the strategy at the end of the day was called, let's leave it to Tesco. Right, so if your food security is based upon a company whose unofficial motto is take out against it and uh, taking every shitty city over Tesco, right? <laughs> then you know you know that you've outsourced a lot of your responsibilities to the private sector, and yeah, growth basically through financialized growth rather than manufacturing, etc. That was the British niche, and you know if you blow up your if you blow up your industrial sector. Because it wasn't very good, let's face it. British, do you remember the, the the Morris Marina? I mean, you know, just the princess, the Austin. But go back to cars at the 70s and try and find one you'd legitimately like to drive, right? They were terrible. So, you know, this stuff crashes and burns. And what is it the Britain has? Well, this is where it goes back to empire. 
we've always had a huge financial sector that's far bigger than the domestic economy in terms of the flows that it controls. Why is that? Because we intermediate capital for all over the world. Guess mm -hmm. what? That became the core of the growth model, which is okay, why everybody well, in my generation moved to London. Okay, my last scenario for you um, is the growth model for uh, an independent Scotland. Let's say we're independent by 2030. What does that look like? Well, first of all, you have to know what your growth model is now. And I spent several months trying to figure that out, and it was very hard because it literally is a nation of shopkeepers. So if you, yeah. your, your largest sector is government services and healthcare, that, that's not a revenue generator. Your mm -hmm. second service thing is retail uh, and uh, basically wholesale. I think that's about 30% of the economy altogether. Uh, then after that, you've got hospitality and a few other sectors. It's not exactly screaming, you know, here's large multinational enterprises that can churn out high value exports that's going to earn us a shit ton of money. As I said, you're not really a small open economy. You are a peripheral part of a small free trade, a mid-sized mid free trade zone called the United Kingdom. So on the one hand, you know, I fully understand the desire to be separate, but you know, the idea that this isn't going to hurt, oof, you can't mm. really say that Brexit's the worst thing ever and then commit the biggest Brexit of all time, which is literally what this is. So if you're going to think about this being independent, you have to think very sensibly about what that means and how you're going to develop income, generating assets to pay for stuff. Why? Because at the end of the day, as a small open economy, which you then will be, you need to balance your imports and your exports over the long term, or everyone thinks your currency is shite. And at that point, they dump it, prefer payments in British pounds, and then you get a run on your foreign exchange, and you get a mini Argentina on your hands. So just because you're independent and you can print bits of money doesn't mean anything if you don't have things to back it up. Think about your one of your most famous sectors is whiskey. Question for you. Who owns it? It is a French luxury group and about five American investors. Man. Right. So basically, you kind of have to have a growth model that is able to generate these incomes and has these assets. And then we can talk about what that would be like in a future scenario. When you don't even really know what that is and how it's going to work, then that's a flight into fantasy. And I'm just too old to do fantasy economics. The point that I would like us to get to is that there's a realization that's, that there was never a growth model. It was no one was ever concerned or interested in the idea of a growth model for Scotland because it was part of a bigger growth model for the UK, right, which was focused exactly. on. Totally was focused. Yeah. So, so, so we are in a position where it's kind of like, well, of course we haven't got a growth model because no one's ever considered it important. But moving forward, it's where do we see your place? Your, and I'll give you your comparator case then. It's Ireland, right? So let's think about Ireland. The problem with small open economies that are poor is that they're poor. And what that means is you don't have enough savings or enough sort of indigenous capital to invest at scale to get out of being poor. So how do you solve that problem? How did Ireland solve that problem? Well, for 50 years, they didn't. They basically had the Catholic Taliban run into place. And it was their biggest export in the 1960s was Irish laborers to London. So it was only in the 1970s and 1980s that they began to go, hang on a minute, what have we got a comparative advantage in? How about taxes? What else have we got? We've got relatively skilled people in a reasonable university sector. Why don't we invest in that? And then we can play the whole Boston connection and get a shit ton of American money to come in here. And we'll use ourselves as the entrepot for getting into Europe. That's what they did. They're now a very rich society. Here's, here's the thing. It took them another 40 years. So it's a very long road to do these things. It doesn't happen overnight. Now, can we imagine that? Yes, I was involved in a Scottish government project, which was a 10-year reimagining of the Scottish economy. Now, like I say, I don't do fantasy economics. And until you actually have not just independence, but actual real fiscal capacity, it's not clear what you can do with this stuff. But the ingredients are pretty straightforward. It pishes down. <laughs> You've got loads of water and natural resources, right? There's that. There's not many people. 80% of you live within the central belt. You know why that's a winner? Because most growth is generated in cities. So the transfer problem, basically, from the central bank to the rest of the central belt to the rest of the country is way, way easier to solve than London to the rest of the UK, simply because it's 80%, 20% rather than 30%, 70%. Mm. So there's so many things you can imagine. There's unpalatable things. Personally, it was up to me. I'd rent the gear lock and the holy lock to the Americans and the Brits for $2 billion a year for storing their nuclear weapons, their submarines. 
Because if you did that, your British share of national debt over 50 years would be paid off. You would actually emerge debt free if you signed that contract. But because you've got this thing about no nukes, no nukes, like if anybody cares if you have it, if, it, if the balloon ever goes up, it doesn't really matter. You're dead anyway, right? You might as well take the cash while it's there. There's loads of things that could be done, right? But in order to do that, you need to actually do have a serious long-term credible plan as to how this is going to work over the long term. What are we actually going to say to the British Treasury about how we're going to take our share of the national debt? Because if you think you're starting off with the default, you're dead already, right? So it's time to basically have that very... Forget the electoral cycles. This year, the SNP will... No, 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 stop. No. You have to have a credible thing that's going to make people like me go, this is a project worth investing in. They know what they're doing. Yeah, Mark, I, how I wish we had time to discuss because there's a lot of that I, I disagree with, but we are here to hear your opinion on all of these <laughs> other things. So well, um, no, that's another... Well. Oh, what was wrong we with can't. What was wrong no, with no, we we can't. I would, I, I, I would, I would, I would love to go into that, and I'm sure the audience. And next year, when you come, then right. we'll maybe be able, be able to, be able to do that. But that that was fascinating for your insight. Thank, thank you so much. It's a, it's a question from Richard Blacklock, and Richard, thanks for this. So, do sovereign governments have a greater policy space than they admit to are or are aware of? It depends on the government. I mean, Argentina has a sovereign poverty, sovereign space and a sovereign currency. It's not done it any good at whatsoever because it's got a chronic problem. Does Britain have more capacity? Absolutely. Labour knows this damn well, but they're not going to say it because they'll be murdered by the Tory press. Um, if, if the very fact, look, here, I'm, I'm the Fox Mulder of MMT. I want to believe, right? But there's a thing called the current account constraint. And at the end of the day, if you're a small open economy, you need to have things you can sell to everybody else to get the stuff that you don't make. And Scotland doesn't make very much. Cars, phones, drugs, MRI scanners, all that shit's going to have to be bought with other stuff that you sell. So the notion that it's all right, we'll just basically default. You said it's legal, but I'm pretty sure the investor community would be rather pissed, right? And then we'll just print some money. What could possibly be go wrong with that? Well, why would I want to hold your money? You've got zero credibility. I insist on payment in dollars or I insist on payment in pounds because you're a bunch of clowns. So how's that going to work? It, MMT applies, if it applies anywhere, to the United States because it's the global savings asset. Nobody else gets to do this. Literally nobody. The only one that comes close is China because you can't actually trade their currency because there's three levels of capital controls. So unless you're willing to do massive import substitution, consumption suppression, and capital controls, you're not going to be able to get a small economy to behave like a very big economy that issues a credit asset. I just don't buy it. Okay, and I've been so, through it dozens of times. Okay, so again, I'm going to disagree with that. But also from Richard Blacklock, Mark, you said that Angonomics, that you were uh, MMT sympathetic, but not fully convinced. Yeah, so that's it. a couple of years ago, I was listening to you on Macro and Cheese, I think, and it, you said... Um, so if they start rounding up MMTers and uh, that they would um, <laughs> van. So why why did you say that? Why would you say you're MMT sympathetic? Because governments do have more fiscal space. I wrote a whole book on why austerity is bullshit. Right? Uh, you can't cut your way to prosperity, but you can do all of that in a standard framework. I don't need to embrace MMT to actually have those policy positions. MMT is closed economy Keynesianism. That's all it is. And you don't live in closed economies. So unless you have scale, which effectively gives you closure, which is what the United States has, and you have a credit asset that everybody wants to buy your financial instruments because they regard it as a safe asset, you don't get to play that game. Now, I've been through this with like leading MMT figures over many, many years, and it basically comes down to this. If somebody can give me a good explanation as to how the current account doesn't matter for small open economies and they can do MMT, I'll listen to it. The answers are usually capital controls, and less consumption, and swapping domestic production for international goods. You'll just get poor as shit. This one is from uh, one of our attendees, and I think it's the most important question for a big section of, of our audience. It's from Kath Jones. Uh, she says, what can the Scottish government or the independence movement do right now and during the transition period to independence to minimise the disruption to the Scottish economy? Well, given the fact that you have no fiscal powers apart from those given to you by the central government, 
you don't have your own currency. You don't have a bond market of any scale, although you can issue a wee bit. There's very little you can do. I would say the one thing, if you wanted to go in this direction, you could do is try and get your own debt management office and actually try and issue some bonds and figure out if the market would pay for them and what the spread over treasury, over um, over gilts would be and how much it's going to cost to finance this transition. Because until you got an idea of that, you're literally flying in the dark. So, so you wouldn't be saying things like we have to improve our energy security and sovereignty and our food security you, you and sovereignty. You don't own any of that. Look, mm -hmm. stop, stop. You don't own any of that. So how do you improve the thing that you don't own and you don't control? Start there, mm -hmm. right? If you don't own your energy infrastructure, if it's owned by E.ON, if it's owned by as your, 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 um, um, your energy infrastructure is owned by asset managers, like everybody else's is owned by, by Macquarie in Australia, right? So how are you going to improve that when you don't even own it and you have no capacity to buy it? I mean, that's what I mean. About, I don't do fantasy economics. I'm too old yeah. for this. And then the final question has got to be on currency. You know the current plan for the moment is for Scotland after the transition period, which might be five to seven years, to have sterling as its currency. And the other option that's really clear is that Scotland starts day one with its own currency. I'd love to briefly know your thoughts on those two scenarios. All right. So let's take all of our own independent views out of this and just look at it from the point of view of the rest of the world, right? First of all, Scotland is... What is it again? Eight percent of British GDP and GD, British GDP is about two percent of global GDP. So we're not even up to rounding error, ter error, error territory, right? So let's say, for example, that you know you just go legally, we don't have to pay any share of debt, so we're starting off with nothing. And here's a new currency; it's called the haggis. Why would I want? A, why would I want that? The only reason I would want that is if I'm doing trade with Scotland, and I wanted to sell something in or buy something from Scotland. If I didn't believe that your currency was worth anything then I would insist that you would find US dollars. For you to find US dollars, you have to think about the exchange rate to the haggis to the dollar. And if you start off basically what is a de facto default, then you're telling the markets that you're not to be trusted. So I think on paper, there's a really good idea. Let's have our currency from day one. And I can actually see more serious arguments of why you want to do that. I think that you actually need to basically build a little bit of sort of like credibility with the people who are going to be lending you money because you don't have enough of your own and the people that you want to invest in your country. If you start off basically saying to international investors, what was the first thing you did? Oh, we just defaulted on the Bank of England because it turned out we didn't need to pay any of that shit. Watch me not invest. We take the we we take sterling as our own currency. What's well, the scenario? You, what's what you're using there? anyway. I mean, it's not, it's not about mm -hmm. a power thing, right? It's practicality. It's in your pocket. It's in your accounts, right? You want to really go re-denominate everything and every single bank account onto something that's probably going to have a volatile exchange rate. The minute you do that, I'll have a bank. If I lived in Scotland, I'd have a bank account in Carlisle because then at least I know what my money was worth. These things take time. People have to build the entirety of currency is about confidence. Confidence is not given by nationalist fiat. Mark, you've been absolutely wonderful. It's so much of the uh, information that you've given us and the opinion, I think, is going to power a lot of our debate over the next two days. I wish you were here to hear some of our counter arguments and, and comments and suggestions. I'm from sure our at the end of two days you'd take me out and burn me. The few, the, the few <laughs> days. No, 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 because you, you'd be you'd be you'd be driving the van for MMT after three days with us, Mark. Oh, I'm no, absolutely no, no. positive I'm, I'm of afraid, that. I'm All right, you'd be in the passenger I'm, I'm seat. You'd be in the passenger seat then. I might, the I might, I might be basically on the same road in the same vicinity, heading off people who are trying to run you off the road. But you know, it would always be an adjacent relationship. It's unfortunate we didn't get to cover the topic that's so dear to our hat and also yours, which is which is the ecological crisis. Maybe we'll get you onto the show later in the year to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to come back. Matt, thank you so much. See you next year. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. You got it, mate. Bye. Bye. Lovely to Bye see now. you. Ta -ra.